Okay. Um, how many times did they ping? Nine minutes after the Thresher's mainframe sonar starts pinging 3.5 kilohertz, uh, she d she stops transmitting because they probably used up all the battery if they were using the battery to ping with. They heard a total of 37 pings from the Thresher's mainframe sonar system. They lied to us. I'm so pissed off that they didn't tell us this. These records started being released last year, about 10 months ago, and I've been reading them as they come out. And they're usually between three and 600 page dumps that I've been going through meticulously. And there hasn't really been any new earth shaking information until today. Today was the first time I read something I didn't know. And it sucks because it's not good. Anyway, so we're beginning on page 119 of 600 because the first 100 pages is just a mess uh, that I haven't really organized in my head yet. But we're going to begin with commanding officer radio communication between the USS Seawolf, which is a submarine um, that's operating in the vicinity of, of, of uh, Cape Cod, you know, where, where the sea trial is taking place. So the USS Seawolf is going to become one of the recovery vessels or search vessels just because, she, because of her proximity. So... Radio message, this is what radio message formats look like in the Navy. They have the from line, the to line, the subject line, the reference, enclosures, blah, blah, blah. So um, it says from commanding officer Seawolf to task force group. So this is the actual Seawolf responding to tasking. Uh, and he says, uh, in accordance with enclosures, the report is classified. Okay, let's scroll down here. Here we go. We're, we're, we're going to get into the narrative of the USS Seawolf's um, operation to help find the thresher like the day and day after she, she she sunk okay here's a general description the following narrative is a logically divided into four phases each of which begins with a dive below layer depth because remember there's that thermal layer that was interrupted by surfacing and coming above the layer for communications so they're going down looking active sonar pinging communication hunting finding things, going back up to radio periscope depth, communicating what they found and going back down again. They do that according to this four times. And we're gonna go over those times. This begins on 10 April, 1963. They receive at 1439, receive ComSub uh, Floats 2's message. That's like the commander of the Atlantic fleet uh, for submarines. Says directing Sea Wolf and Sea Owl, another vessel, to suspend operations immediately and proceed to lat long blah blah to join search for USS Thresher. So by this time, everyone knows Thresher is not, is lost. They don't know it's sunk. They know that it's lost. It's submerged during sea trials and then they lost voice communications with it. So the ship that's with the Thresher that lost communication with it is radioing for help. USS um, sea Wolf and the Sea Owl are coming to help. Okay, now the USS Sea Wolf that we're going to read from is another submarine. So it's submarine looking for submarine here. Okay, so they respond. They inform ComSub Float 2 that we are in route, in datum. ETA is going to be April 11th, 0900 Romeo. Romeo is Eastern Standard Time. Commence sending our, uh, says given, okay, but, but what they need is they need water. So water space management is a big part of maintaining submarines and not letting them hit each other right so the operating area that the sea wolf had did not include where the thresher was so in this message they're like hey admiral give us the water space we need to transit where you're telling us to go you're telling us to do something that we're not supposed to do just a little formality okay okay the message was sent then they went to 300 feet deep increased speed to flank 20 knots with a 20 knot soa Speed of advance is not necessarily your, your flank bell because SOA is your average speed over time. And you do a lot of things besides go flank for that period of time, like coming to periscope depth to update orders to see if there's any changes. So they may actually be doing like 25 knots, but because they have to go to PD and slow down, their average speed is only 20 knots. So they come to periscope depth, they copy the broadcast uh, at 2200. Wow, very common time to copy the broadcast. I remember doing that a lot when I was in there must be something updated at 2200 that's special uh, surface to make better uh, speed while communicating so they want to go so fast that they're not even slowing down for periscope depth they're going a flank bell until they need a broadcast then they're surfacing to maintain that 
max transit speed of about 15 knots on the surface, eh, about 12 knots on the surface. And then once they copy the broadcast at 12 knots, which is faster than they would be if they were submerged to periscope depth, that's why they're doing that, they submerge again and go back to flank bell. This maximizes their speed. They're in a hurry to find out where is the thresher. Okay, April 11th, 1963. Ooh. 0400 at periscope depth to copy the broadcast uh, communicates with New London sub base. Uh, they surfaced in order to make good speed. So they come to PD and then they surface copy the broadcast uh, and then uh, they copy messages pertaining to the operation at a flank speed on the surface. Luckily, they say the weather is very nice. So the weather is in their favor for for recovery if possible. At 0720, they advise USS Norfolk of where they are. It should be noted that the SAR, the rescue frequency of 2820 kilohertz, uh, is listed for voice and CW. This frequency is extremely crowded with both CW transmissions and voice. So anytime they try to radio the people doing the search, it's just chatter. Like they can't get a word in edgewise on the radio. So they're sending these text messages over the radio. Okay, we're, so we're trying without success to communicate to the on-scene commander, but we cannot because... The radio traffic is just overwhelming of trying to coordinate the forces that are there to find the thresher. At 0753, sighted through the periscope, a possible red object, which might have been a KPOC life vest. A KPOC life vest is the vest we use on submarines at the time of the thresher and a lot of my career as well. Now we use a different life vest, but they see what they think is a life vest. They circle back to see if it is a life vest, spending time not transiting to where they want to go, and they don't see the life vest ever again. So they don't know really what that was. So they continue at an all head flank to get to the search sector, sector that they're supposed to be at. 0920, they receive a message from Norfolk to proceed to datum and search submerged for two hours. You are nearly in the sector assigned. We were nearly in the sector assigned for our search. Uh, by 0753 so at 10 o'clock uh they uh they cite trash in the water so this is the sign of uh, a ship sunk even a submarine if it breaks apart can release a lot of debris and they're seeing debris in the water at 10 10 this is not a good sign if they want to rescue a submarine but it's a good sign that at least maybe they have found the area uh, that they're in Okay, we're going to start dive one at 1030 in the morning. They submerge to 300 feet as ordered. Uh, they have a positive sonar gradient down to 100 feet. So the layers at 100 feet, they're below that. And they're rigged for patrol quiet because they're listening for the sounds of distress. Uh, you know, banging on the hall, voice comms. We have an underway pinger, distress pinger. Uh, they're listening for all those things. So they change to 400 feet because in this environment with the... Uh, layer at 100 feet the, the deeper they go the more they can hear so you can just tell that by this statement right here and knowing a little bit about the environment okay so they change up the 400 feet they go onto their electric motors of course because they're that deep and they listen for uqc communications that's underwater communications from the distress voice uh, communication device and the distress pinger there's a bqc and a uqc so they went to 500 feet, 600 feet, going down deeper and deeper, uh, all the way down to test depth, still uh, looking for, or listening for the thresher. At 1140, seawater sample uh, test depth uh, showed activity of 20 times background radiation. This reading was also in error. Uh, we knew it had to be. Well, if the reactor compartment had broken open and fuel was leaked to seawater, you may see an activity of 20 times the background. So this may not be an error in reading if the uh, submarine reactor vessel broke apart. Now, in 2021, we know that that didn't happen. But at the time of this investigation, they didn't necessarily know that. Thank God that didn't happen. Okay, so the SQS-4, which is the active sonar, uh, begins, uh, had a target bearing 135. This is the first indication of them finding something submerged is at 1130 in the morning on the 11th of April 1963 at a range of 2000 yards bearing 135. The contact moved to 130 at 1900 yards. So why is the contact moving? It's because the contact is actually stationary, but as they close it, move towards it, it's showing a little bit of bearing rate. That's all generated by the USS Seawolf approaching the target. Okay, so it is a stationary uh, object somewhere in front of them at 2,000 yards. Okay, the contact bears 039, 3,000 yards. So they're trying to 
triangulate, locate where this thing is. Uh, at at noon, it was uh, 139, 3,000 yards, continuing to close. Contact plots stationary. So that's what they did there is they verified it's not moving at all. The reason for the range increase is believed to be that we had two contacts on the same bearing, and they lost one of the contacts and uh, had one remaining. So a little bit of sonar, you know, a false target, if you will. So the as, as they closed to the target, as they got within 1,000 yards of the target, they lost contact. The reason for that is, is the projector on the USS Seawolf is on top of the submarine. So as the submarine goes over top of a target, the, uh, the hull itself shadows the active ping uh, with, with its own hull. It's kind of like having a baffle region, but going straight down. So they mark on top whenever they lose active sonar contact. They heard a 3.5 kilohertz tone at this time. 3.5 kilohertz is the UQC, it's the BQC tone in CW mode. Well, that's the distress pinger, okay? Any sonarmen, even sonarmen today, know this frequency. Okay, so they hear the distress pinger. This is great news. They found what they were looking for. They don't know it's the thresher yet, but somebody down there has a BQC. Okay, so uh, the BQCs, they have two of them. One is in the forward compartment. One is in the after engine room compartment. Um, the signal is from the other BQC. Ours are passive. So what the first thing that the Seawolf does is make sure that their own BQCs aren't actually transmitting by accident. These BQCs are pinned shut. So in order to operate them, you've got to remove a pin that's got a little steel lanyard on it and then flip a switch in the upward position. And that begins the CW pulse every, I think it's 30 seconds. Okay, so at noon 15, 15 minutes later, the thresher via underwater communications, this is voice, um, commonly called the Gertrude, uh, says, turn, on, turn your BQC pinger on and off, we hear you. So the thresher hasn't said anything yet, they're trying to get voice communications to them to see if they respond. And then again, they repeat, uh, if it is your BQC, send us A's. Um, a minute later, they said, request steady king on the BQC. You can hit uh, a button on the BQC where it sends a, a steady pulse at 3.5 kilohertz. This is all public now, so I can say these things. Normally, you don't talk about frequencies like this, but there it is. Okay, um, so they send a series of five, okay, hold on, two thresher. Send us a series of five dashes on the BQC. So that's five 3.5 kilohertz tones. We hear that may be interrupted keying now. Okay, this is the first time they think they get a response. We hear what may be interrupted keying now may be dashes, but no particular number. Echo ranging of the DDs is causing much interference because the destroyers up top side don't know they found the seawars, found the thresher. So they're up there with their active, just banging away like surface ships will do, causing interference. Okay, at 72 feet, the captain decides at uh, 1230, he has to surface and report. We think we found him. Okay, stop transmitting active sonar. You're making it hard for uh, us to contact them. So they surface. They don't even bother going to periscope depth. They just surface. They get on the radio and uh, they request for active sonar silence. End dive one. That's the first of four dives. This is all on the 11th of April. At 1140 in the afternoon, uh, still on the surface, uh, they send, uh, looks like a radio message amplifying BQC report. Okay, so they tell the world now we have underwater distress beacon is active and they may have been trying to respond to our calls we're going to begin dive two and see if they'll talk to us now that the active sonar is out of the equation they dive directly down to 400 feet um, and they start a second communication attempt to thresher on underwater on uqc that's the voice if you're receiving my gertrude key your bqc uh, General, uh, during the dive two, Seawolf completely unplugged and turned off its own BQCs. So there was absolutely no chance that their own BQC would be triggered by their calls. Okay. They just completely unplugged them. Okay. At 1354, two thresher on UQC. That's the handheld thing. If you hear my transmission, key your underwater telephone. That would release a tone that triggers the receiving BQC to begin translating the single sideband transmission. That's what that tone is. Okay, so they begin receiving a BQC 23.5 kilohertz tone three times 
uh, and tapping continuously. So at 1355 on April 11th, 1963, there are people alive in the Thresher. This is contrary to what they told us in U.S. Navy submarine school. They told us that they had collapsed, died instantly. Everything was very quick, quick. This is two days later. People are alive on the Thresher responding to calls. This was released this morning. 1358, April 11th, the Thresher. If This is from the Sea Wolf. If you can hear me, transmit your underwater telephone. More UQC to Thresher receiving 23.5 killer stones. We feel sure we hear two BQC tones, which would make sense because there's two of them on the Thresher. Like I said, there's one forward, there's one aft. They're both pinging 23.5 kilohertz. Because they weren't started at the same time, there's a little bit of offset. One is very sharp and clear. The other one is fuzzy and muted. We don't know why. Uh, they should be within about 100 feet of each other. So there shouldn't be a big difference in clarity. But one sounds like crap and one sounds very good. Okay, uh, two more 23.5 kilohertz tones to Thresher. We hear your underwater telephone send five dashes. All UQC messages to Thresher were repeated three to four times, uh, taking water samples for radioactivity frequently. Uh, that report is in Enclosure 4. I haven't got to Enclosure 4 yet. Um, eventually, if I get to it and there's something there, we'll talk about that. Uh, but their first radioactive sampling saw samples 20 times greater than background in radiation, uh, even though they didn't believe the indications. Okay, 1405, it's two o'clock in the afternoon now, trying to call CL on the UQC to relay message to uh, the commanding officer in charge, topside. Receiving tone signal from the RICONS, that's, that's the underwater communication gear, uh, 3.5 kilohertz every 30 seconds, which is the auto ping. You can put this thing on auto ping, and it pings this frequency every 30 seconds. Uh, accurately time stopwatch. They they can also use that for ranging. You can see how close you are to it by by the transmit and receive delay. There's an advanced procedure for that that they don't talk about here, so we won't talk about. Anyway, uh, these these tools these pings are very important in finding things on the sea floor. That's why they're there on submarines. Okay, to Thresher, we hear your underwater telephone again. If you uh, will send five dashes, we will have positive identification. Send five dashes. Again, send five dashes. Uh, two minutes later, frequency shifts between the two BQCs are now quite evident. They turn to course 230 because they're passing over the top of her. Uh, continue keying your underwater telephone. They turn again. Uh, keep listening to the tones. At 215, now hold signals of uh, 23.5 kilohertz and 3.5 kilohertz BQS sonar, which the Thresher has. 3.5 kilohertz is the mainframe sonar system that is active from the Thresher, who was supposed to be sunk a day ago. Okay, this is turning into a freaking ghost story at this point because everybody's supposed to be dead. But the mainframe sonar not only works, it has power to transmit active, which is an enormous load of electricity. So clearly the thresher didn't all just implode all at once. There's people living on this thing for hours after she's lost communication the day before. She's able to use her mainframe sonar. Someone on the thresher pinged their mainframe sonar system. This all came out this morning. 1420, five minutes later, the Thresher send victors uh, with the letter V, et cetera, uh, and continue transmitting your 23.5 kilohertz. So what they're trying to do, they're so close to the Thresher now over top of it, that they're trying to measure the forward 23.5 kilohertz to the after 3.5 kilohertz, knowing that those are about 100 feet apart. If they can get right between the two, then they'll know exactly where she's at. But they already have a really good idea where she's at. I mean, already they, they know within 100 meters of, of, of where she's supposed to be. Now, it's not clear if she's on the bottom. This is like 7,000 feet of water. So it's possible that she's not on the bottom that she's somewhere between test depth and crush depth for a long time, for hours, trying to save themselves, communicating with the sea wolf, responding to calls. Okay, um, how many times did they ping? 
nine minutes after the thresher's mainframe sonar starts pinging 3.5 kilohertz, uh, she d she stops transmitting because they probably used up all the battery if they were using the battery to ping with. They heard a total of 37 pings from the Thresher's mainframe sonar system. They lied to us. I'm so pissed off that they didn't tell us this. 2.30 in the afternoon. Okay, the Thresher, continue king your sonar and telephone as we're trying to pass over you is what their CWF is telling them. Uh, we, they said, we believe we passed directly over the thresher. We had bearing rate on both the uh, 23 kilohertz pinging. Uh, they marked the position as 41, 41, two, uh, by longitude 65.02.2 uh, at a depth of 1350 fathoms, which somebody can convert that to feet, but it's really freaking deep. It's somewhere in the vicinity of 7,000 feet, just doing the mental gym in my head. They changed up to 100 feet uh, to eventually go to the surface and let everyone know that they're hearing mainframe active. 37 pings. That should be the title of the new Thresher book that talks about these. I would title that book 37 pings because it's 37, de 37 desperate you calls for help. This breaks my heart, man. It's terrible. Um, so they pass directly over it. They go to the Crazy surface. News. Yeah, this is this is bonkers, man. This is probably why the Navy didn't want to release this stuff. Oh, let's not go down that path yet. Let's read what's going on. Okay, uh, four, 2.30, uh, very garbled. Okay, there's a CW transmission. This is a voice transmission, very garbled, and everyone listening has a different opinion as to what was said at the time. Uh, remember I told you everything is always being recorded on submarines? Well, they go to the tape and sonar, and I guess it's I guess they're recording in radio as well, and they re-listen to the tape to see what the thresher was saying, but it's too garbled for anyone to make out. Okay, um, see, it's still 2.30 in the afternoon. It says, we believe we hear you. They're on the Gertrude again saying, hey, we think we hear you. Please send us the message again, hoping that they would say it a second time. And then they said, we may, at 12.33, we hear very weak voice over eight kilohertz, RICOM. Okay, so the way this works is um, eight kilohertz is the carrier frequency, and then your voice is on the lower side band of that carrier frequency. So they're hearing the eight kilohertz and garbled voice with that, um, but they don't, again, don't know what he's saying. Obviously the thresher's in distress. Their equipment's not working right. Uh, they ping 37 times. Uh, and then they say to the thresher, we cannot read your voice. We hear your voice, we can't understand your voice. And then there's just continuous reports to, please send CW pulse, repeat, please send CW. Uh, and CW could also refer to mainframe. It could be either way. Um, they continue to get the distress pingers. They don't get the mainframe sonar anymore. They've probably exhausted their battery with 37 pings if they were using the battery to do that. Re keep in mind, uh, the thresher was lost the day before. So the, if they were living at all, they were living on the battery. So it's already in a weakened state. Uh, whew, at 254, it's almost three o'clock in the afternoon. They're right on top of the CW pings, the distress pinging. They come up to the periscope depth to report again and end di dive two. Okay, so they make the report. They're right on top. Mark position. We found them. Uh, somebody's alive in the thresher. Someone's responding with voice and pinging active sonar. Hopefully more than one person is alive at this point. I feel terrible for whoever that person was. I, I would love to know. It's just, it's such a, this is such a new development. It's blowing my mind. Okay, so the start of dive three, dive to 500 feet uh, to the thresher. They say, this is Seawolf, send CW. They keep going down. They keep saying, uh, send CW. And at, at this point, they say no joy of any kind. They don't have any CW, uh, any transmission from the Seawolf at four o'clock in the afternoon. Things are progressing so quickly. Um, to Thresher, they say send CW three times in a row. Uh, they go down to uh, 600 feet. Um, oh, here we go. At uh, 1617, commence SQS for echo ranging. Changing depth to 400 feet. Uh, this has been depth of which we heard the Thresher before. So they're going from 300 feet to 400 feet. Okay. So banging on metal or metal on metal is heard in sonar at a bearing of 130. Somebody 
out there in the water is banging on a hull. So to Thresher, they say bang five times on the hull and they repeat that twice. Uh, they may have had a BQC 23.5 kilohertz about 10 seconds ago. Uh, echo ranging classified DD. A secure fathometer. Okay, so they're mistaking some of the active now as a destroyer's fathometer as it passes nearby. So let's take a moment and just realize what we're reading. The This is the ship's log of the USS Seawolf submerged looking for the thresher. Uh, and finding it, but they're also getting a lot of false positives. Like the destroyer's active was interfering with them. Now that the active is secured, they can hear the destroyer's fathometer, which by coincidence is very similar to a submarine distress beacon frequency, which, you know, what are the chances of that? But apparently that's how it works. So the BQC that they were hearing two hours ago, was that the destroyer's fathometer and not the thresher? Like I can begin to poke holes in this a little bit if I look hard enough, but I can't poke holes in are the 37 mainframe pings. The only thing doing that is the thresher. Okay, so the thresher, at, okay, to the thresher, we're saying continue banging on the hull, give us a signal. Okay, and here we go. At 1657, bangs are heard again at bearing 155. So they're trying to, you know, get a good direction here. And then they hear bangs again bearing 157. So they've crossed the point of which the uh, thresher is in front of them by going left to right. The bangs are about eight seconds apart. So they say, give us five more bangs to make sure that they can hear them. So someone on the thresher can obviously hear and understand the sea wolf. So the bangs are heard uh, again, at 157, they're very loud this time. They know that they're close. Uh, but they didn't give them five. So this is crazy, man. Absolutely nuts. So they're passing over the sound source at about 5 p.m. Uh, the depth sounding is 1,300 fathoms, extremely deep water. Uh, let's see. Banging is in groups of three. We wonder if they're trying to do the SOS because the SOS is like three dashes and three dots followed by three dashes, some kind of combination of three. So they might be tapping SOS on the hull. That's what they think is happening now. Keep in mind, this is the day after Thresher sunk. This is 24 hours later. This is what blows my mind. How? Okay, five o'clock comes around. They commence a Williamson turn, which is where you do a special turn that brings you right back over the place that you were a few minutes ago, but go in the opposite direction. Um, they continue to call. They continue to ask for banging on the hall. They begin hearing tapping sounds to the north, 13 seconds apart. Uh, the DDs are drowning out our sonars. Ask the CL to have them clear the area. So it's not the DDs sonar anymore. The DDs are right overhead, but their screw blade and wash background broadband noise is interfering with our ability to communicate via taps with the uh, thresher. So they say to the thresher, we heard your taps, do it again. So the reason why they keep asking them to do it again is one, to get a better position. They also want to know that they're still alive. And I know the guys inside the thresher, you know, they're getting frustrated. I'm sure they're like, they found us. They found us, you know, let's, let's get the rescue on. And, but, it, between the time of the rescue and the time of being found is a, is a lot of time where you just got to bang on the hull continuously. And that's what they're asking them to do. Um, let's see. It's 10 minutes before six o'clock in the evening uh, by underwater communications, attempt a rendezvous with the sea owl and send a message to the top side commander. Uh, the UQC is terrible because of the layer that's at 100 feet. Uh, so they're trying to stay submerged because they found the thresher a third time. Every time they go to PD to communicate, they lose the thresher's position. Um, that's through navigation slight errors and stuff, because obviously the thresher's not moving very much. Um, and so they want to make the reports while submerged. But because there's a layer at 100 feet, they can't do it. They have to go to the surface. The sea owl says, uh, your report's very garbled. Come to 200 feet. Uh, so they came to 200 feet, made the report, and returned back to 400 feet uh, for better UQC uh, operation. Uh, calling any station on the UQC, communicating with Sea Owl, uh, says louder but garbled, close. In other words, come closer. Uh, BQC message was sent to uh, the commanding officer of, in charge of the search topside. 
Uh, they have the good Latin long now. It's now longitude 6504. Uh, we'll return to datum. Using underwater communication to the thruster, commencing circle datum. So now they're going to start circling where they believe the thresher is. This is a great way to just mark position. Top side, a lot of things are happening. They're trying to get rescue on site. You know, they're, they're marking the position, you know, top side with flares and, and buoys. Eventually, there will be a buoy anchored over where the thresher is. So everyone knows, go to the buoy, that's the thresher. But that hasn't happened yet. That's coming up. A little bit of foreshadowing there for you. It says, uh, due to saturated sonars by the DDs, they decided to blow sanitaries and clear any noisy ship function now. Okay, so the Sea Wolf going into like the end of day two, they have to do some housekeeping. And one of the things they have to do is blow sanitaries and do some noisy functions. They decide to do that all at once and then go back to trying to find, uh, try, trying to find the, the uh, thresher. They do that at 1647 in the evening. So they're traversing the area, uh, saturating sonars. She's passive. Uh, the seal says that she's trying to clear the area of DDs. Yeah, the DDs don't want to leave. I kind of don't blame them. Everybody wants to be helping, but they're actually hurting by being so close. If the DDs just went dead in the water, they would they would be fine. But because they're steaming around up there, making all that noise, it's hard to hear. Keep in mind, this is all happening in a very small area. Uh, okay, let's go down again. You can read all this yourself from the uh, ONI website. So bearing, uh, so so they found it again. They got mushy echo returns, maybe pinnacle. Uh, they think that might be the sea owl. So they're not, they're they they've lost the thresher again. So at seven o'clock in the evening, they're trying to uh, find the thresher. They're circling the position of the thresher, uh, but they're not finding her. They lost contact on pinnacle about one thousand yards. Turned on fathometer, and shortly thereafter, recorded a sounding of a hundred and thirty-five fathoms underneath the keel. So here's a clue. They know that they're in 1,300 feet of water. They pass over the thresher and they get a, a, a straight down ping as the fathometer and they get a return 135 fathoms beneath uh, the sea wolf, which is at 300 feet, I think. So convert fathoms to feet. We need to do that right now. We need to do that right now. Let's go calc. Okay. Um, one, three, five times six feet, 810 feet plus 300 feet for the fathometer. Oh my God. The thresher potentially could be at 1100 feet, which is above collapse depth. They had a casualty that caused them to lose depth control, but they didn't sink. They only went down to 1100 feet for a day. If this fathometer return is from the thresher, which is why people are alive. This all makes sense now. Okay, the sounding was incorrectly taken. It represents a triple and third echo. Okay, disregard. I should have read the next sentence. Wow, fuck. See, you desperately want to know what happened. And that that's, I'm sure, how these guys feel. Whenever they saw that return, they probably thought, oh my God, this is it. But no. Okay, so they do a Williamson turn now, trying to go back over the active contact again, passing over uh, the pinnacle of the active contact shortly thereafter, taking continuous soundings, uh, and they're getting the recording of 1,300 fathoms again. All right, so ixnay everything I just said about the 1,100 feet theory. Uh, I don't know why people are alive on the thresher a day after it sunk. It doesn't make any sense. If it wasn't such a tragedy, I would call it a ghost ghost story but it's it's real people dying so i'm not even going to go there uh see they slowed to a minimum turns they're still looking for the thresher they keep asking the thresher send us a signal wrap on the hall uh still ahead of the pinnacle range they're going to pass 525 yards uh bearing north so they did hear bangs at eight o'clock at night 8 30 at night and they tell the thresher we hear you banging uh repeat bang three more times uh, they pass over the active detection called Pinnacle. Uh, no change in soundings. The Thresher believed we heard you, but could not get bearing. Bang three more times. So they are in continuous communication, but it's only one way communication, it seems. Like the Thresher can hear the Sea Wolf talking to it, and they're responding to commands, but they're unable to talk back. Yeah. Absolute freaking tragedy, man. 
Whew. So they continue this operation from till nine o'clock, continuing to cross over the top of the thresher, trying to contact it. At this point, what can the sea wolf do besides what it's doing? The sea wolf is not a rescue vessel. It doesn't have the equipment to rescue anyone on the thresher. So I think they're just doing all they can by maintaining contact in a hope that they can get the rescue vessels to that position in time at some point in the future. So basically this is just, uh, just repeating itself. They're going over the thresher's position over and over again. The thresher continues to respond with banging on the hall. This is a damn, this is a submariner's nightmare, you know, which is maybe why they didn't tell us this. This is a, this is a nightmare to be alive on a sunken submarine. Mm. Terrible. All right, we're coming to the end of the dive. Okay, end dive three. So they only did four dives. So I uh, see top side, the commander Packard, comm sub Lance Staff is riding us. So they got comm sub Pack on, on station top side. He's been extremely helpful in commanding officer in terms of advice in many matters. Okay, this is kind of a report to the inspector, you know, complimenting the on-site commander for doing everything that he can. Uh, the heading of the CL will get range and bearing. Um, from Blenny to set up UQ save relay. Proceed first, state it further. Okay. Oh, whoops. We're trying to get to the fourth uh, dive here. They only did four dives, and we're coming up on the last one. Uh, it's now the 12th of April. So this is like day two into the recovery. We're coming up on the 48 hour mark. Mm. Okay. Uh, at, at midnight, they hear a fathometer, probably the hydro ship topside. It's 12 kilohertz. That's a, uh, well, that's a very common frequency for a fathometer. So that's probably not from the thresher. Uh, she's probably searching for the assigned sector. Okay, so they hear the fathometer from the Sea Owl, which is the topside vessel. All right, so at midnight, they're at periscope depth, getting a fix so they can return to datum. At, at 2 p.m., they are at datum, ventilating. They're up at periscope depth. They're copying the broadcast. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, they begin their fourth and final dive on the thresher. So uh, they're submerged now at 3.30. They start uh, active sonar operations to try and find the, the echo. They do get a return bearing north, uh, but they, it ends up being the destroyer. They have no, um, no, no other contacts. Okay, echo ranging begins at 0400. Still calling the thresher on the underwater communications to send a signal. Uh, they heard fathometer from one of the topside vessels. Uh, the Norfolk and the Skylark are up there using fathometers. So that's kind of confusing things. They're hearing those fathometers. Uh, the sound, they go down to 400 feet. The sounding is 1,200 fathoms. Um, it's 5 o'clock in the morning, and they're not hearing any replies. So this is kind of a key time. The thresher stops responding to calls for, you know, contact after midnight beginning on the 12th of April, which ironically, I think is the day this Titanic sank. Uh, just a coincidence there. Okay. Uh, the end of, okay. They, they end dive four as the sun rises on the morning of the 12th. They send the final reporting lacking any type of contact or an even active contact with the thresher. They have no contact after midnight End narrative. Wow. So this was the bombshell we read this morning. Um, Apparently somebody was alive on the thresher about approximately 24 hours after the thresher had lost contact. After she dove, they had a casualty. Um, up until now, the whole world was told by the United States government that they sank and imploded immediately and died. Well, they did sink. They eventually imploded, but it took at least 24 hours for everyone on board to die. Some people might have died initially during the casualty, but they had active response from the crew for another 24 hours. And they didn't share that information with anybody. This report's been classified for 50 years. Um, yeah, and what do you guys think? I mean, do you release that type of information to the families at the time? Do you tell them, are you honest with them? And be like, hey, yeah, yeah, your son, yeah, he suffered for a day. He was bagging on the hall, slowly uh, dying of oxygen deprivation and uh, dehydration, probably freezing in these waters. I wonder if they show you the op area here. There it is. 
Wow. Let's see if we got any uh, notes here. So I guess this was the search area here is what it looks like. I wonder what this number four is. Is that the position you think? What, what I don't know is why did they do this, the first dive in such deep water? They, they should do the first dive in a water that's not at a depth that's not recoverable in case something goes wrong. Um, oops. Maybe we can zoom out a little bit, get a better perspective. So here's Nova Scotia, basically just south of Halifax. Well, Halifax is up here, but south of Nova Scotia and uh, east of Cape Cod is where the thresher went down. This looks like maybe the continental shelf, even though the continental shelf doesn't go in like that. Oh, this is a uh, this is a front maybe. Oh, that's the one hundred hundred fathom curve. Okay, like yeah, they should do the um, sea trials here instead of uh, out here. But yeah, okay, wow. Sorry for spending so long on this. Um, I didn't have time to digest this all this morning before. You know, this this information just came out this morning, so I'm still trying to go through it. I got another four hundred pages to go. And if there's anything new like this, we'll go over it on Wednesday. But uh, we're going to take a minute here, just catch our breath, and uh, go back to something a little more positive, a little more fun, like some Cold Waters gameplay. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, kind of going through this. I may edit this down into something more concise for, for YouTube. But, uh, yeah, it's a shock that somebody was alive on the Thresher for approximately 24 hours, responding to calls for communication. That's the breaking news. All right, uh, we'll be right back. Give us about five minutes, okay? Five minutes, guys.